I'm a program manager on Dynamics AX, and um, I work on tools and features that um, are intended to help you building integrations faster and more efficiently. And um, what I would like to do in this session um, in the next hour, hour and a half, um, is um, first I would like to talk about integration scenarios in general. Um, just what um, canonical integration scenarios you could run into at a very high level, and then um, show you how you can use some of the tools that we provide out of the box for you to build those integrations efficiently and fast. And then in the end, I have a bunch of demos um, that show you the product in action. I will also mention um, some of the changes that we made between AX2009 and um, AX2012. How many of you um, have worked with AAF in Dynamics AX2009? And um, has anybody looked at um, AAF in um, Dynamics AX 2012 yet? OK, it's also quite a few. OK. Very good. So um, let's just, um, in the beginning, before we even get started, um, let's look at the application lifecycle in general, like when you um, have an implementation um, ongoing. Those are the usual steps that you would go through. And you can see that the integration is sort of like after the configuration and customization of your application. That is um, usually when you would start the integration because uh, the integration depends on your customizations. However, it's very important to think about integration from the very beginning, from the very start of your um, project. Because um, depending on what your integration needs are, you might actually have to go back and modify um, your application and your customizations. And in general, it's much, uh, much more efficient or you can um, implement your um, a project much faster if you um, start thinking about integration from the very beginning and make these, uh, design decisions based on the knowledge what your integration scenarios would look like. So let's look at um, some of the integration scenarios that we can think of and some of the motivations behind um, building integrations with Dynamics AX. Let's assume there's Contoso and Contoso um, as a company has implemented Dynamics AX and it's up and running. There's like various applications and um, scenarios you can think of um, where requests would be sent into Dynamics AX, and the motivations can be um, quite different. So you have like applications, enterprise applications, like other CRM or ERP products that you want to integrate with. For example, if you have a hub and spoke scenario where you have um, implemented like one ERP system at the hub and like other systems at the spoke or at the spokes, um, you need to build an integration. Another example, would, another example would be interactive client applications. So you can think about that as um, think of that as um, applications that you run within the enterprise, other um, um, applications that are managed by your IT department, or also those could be applications like as I'm showing on, on this slide, like um, uh, mobile applications where like you have a, um, sales, uh, a sales force out in the field that wants to, for example, enter um, sales orders on site with a customer or create new customers from, from a mobile device. And of course, you have like um, the more traditional um, high data volume um, integration scenarios with trading partners or banks. For example, banks or credit card uh, companies would want to send you credit card information, more transactional data um, that gets um, imported into um, Dynamics AX automatically, ideally through an integration. The alternative um, for all of those scenarios is like a manual process um, where you do not have an integration and you would have to like somehow bridge the gap between the systems. And that is, in general, very inefficient. It's very expensive, and it's also error-prone. Whenever you co uh, copy data, whenever there's manual step involved, it's uh, much easier to um, get erroneous um, data entry and so on. On the other hand, we also have um, scenarios where Dynamics AX would want to send data out of um, Dynamics AX to external systems, systems that are in the cloud, for example, um, for um, searching data, um, for entering um, sales orders also. Um, or you can also send data to other trading partners, again, to banks. For example, you can send out payments to trading partners and different, uh, there's also different scenarios you can think of. The same applies here. You can, in general, um, implement integrations and um, streamline your business processes by automating processes um, and take out a lot of the costs. So that seems to be, in, in general, like, and this is one of the main motivations for integrations is that you can streamline your business operations uh, and business processes. You can reduce the errors. And also, you can extend Dynamics AX, for example, to mobile devices and beyond the um, boundaries of your enterprise. In general, um, when you look at those integration scenarios, there's different flavors, and we'll talk about those in more detail. You can um, send messages or data into Dynamics AX or out of Dynamics AX synchronously or asynchronously, for instance. Um, you can also see that um, there's different, um, different constraints in terms of um, boundaries between companies. 
that exchange the data. Whereas you have enterprise applications that can reside in your um, enterprise. You can also have trading partners that um, are sitting outside of your enterprise that um, you have no control over what systems they have, they have running. And those are all constraints that you have to take into consideration when you start planning for your integrations. So um, let's take one of those examples. Um, just for uh, motivation, I would like to um, show you, uh, give you a quick demo of, um, for example, let's assume I'm a, a salesperson out in the field right now. I'm gonna switch here to my other screen. I'm just gonna show you um, a brief demo of um, what you can do um, if you extend Dynamics AX to other um, form factors and devices. So let's assume um, you, you're a salesperson, you're out in the field and you want to find a customer. You just get a call from that customer. The customer is Contoso um, Retail in Seattle, let's say. And um, you want to find um, where that customer is and maybe get information um, about that customer, which is all stored in Dynamics AX. So what you can do is like you can have a application that for example runs on your mobile device and can be any other device of course as well. And it talks, that uses services which we're gonna talk about in this session to communicate with Dynamics AX, retrieve information, and as we'll later see, you can also update information and, and post data to Dynamics AX. So let's say I want to find a customer. I can just um, type in the customer name in this example. And then I, when I hit search, what happens in the background is um, this application that's running on this emulator for a mobile device uses services to communicate with Dynamics AX and retrieve the customer information. And since Dynamics AX is back in Seattle, it takes a while. <laughs> there we are. So um, you can see this is some data that was pulled out of Dynamics AX. It's not really um, formatted in a nice way as you would expect it in mobile applications, but I think um, you can see the point here. And you can even um, take it one step further. You can build this application out and, for example, get directions, um, building mashups with other um, applications that are available on the cloud. And then, for example, retrieve directions if you wanted to drive from here to um, Seattle. So that's just an example that wants to show um, how you can extend the reach of Dynamics AX to mobile devices. And we'll talk about this example in much more detail because if you want to do something like this, there is a lot of constraints that you don't have when you just do enterprise, intra-enterprise integrations. For example, you cannot use Windows authentication and things like that, but we'll talk about it in much more detail in another demo in the end um, towards the demo section. So let me go back to my presentation. And um, let's, um, um, before, we, before we dive into the details in Dynamics AX and all the tools that you have um, for building those integrations, if you prepare for um, building an integration, those are essentially the steps that you have to walk through in general, like even without Dynamics AX in, in, in the picture. So first you would have to identify um, your integration needs, your scenarios, the systems you want to integrate with, and what the constraints are. Once you know that, um, you can build your services that you need in Dynamics AX. And we'll have some examples um, of services, how you can build them. There's many more tools which I will not be able to cover, but we have a um, lot of um, documentation actually online that um, I can also give you references to but you would encapsulate the business logic that you want to expose from Dynamics AX in uh, services. And again, like there's tools that allow you to do that. Once you've done that, you can publish those services through different transport mechanisms. And again, depending on your um, integration scenarios, those can be synchronous, for example, through web service calls, HTTP or NetTCP, or you can um, publish the same services um, through um, asynchronous um, transport mechanisms such as MSMQ or file. And the important thing to note here is that while um, the, the services framework encapsulates the services, the application integration framework allows you to publish and configure those services independently. So building the services is an almost entirely independent process from publishing and configuring the services, what they look like on the outside. Encapsulating is all about the business logic. Publishing and configuring is all about how you want other, uh, other systems to consume your services. And in the end, of course, you have to build some client applications if you haven't done that already that would consume the services that you published from Dynamics AX. So again, those are the two frameworks that I would, um, I would like to cover in this session. The first one is the services framework that allows you to encapsulate your business logic and build services. And the second one is the application integration framework, or short AIF, which allows you to take those services and publish them for, uh, for consumption by external applications. So um, where do those two frameworks fit in? As you can see on this um, 
high level overview of um, all the um, layers that we have in Dynamics AX. You can see that they fit into the framework layer um, along with all the client and, and server tools that we have. And uh, this goes for, for both services. And they bridge the gap between the application and the foundation um, and the technology stack that we use. So you will see also in this um, presentation that we leverage the whole technology, um, not the whole, but a lot of the technology stack that Microsoft um, provides, including um, um, .NET and um, Visual Studio for, for some of the development, and also, um, of course, um, Internet um, Information Server and so on. So the pains and challenges that we're trying to address in, uh, with, with those two frameworks are mainly targeted at three, three personas that we use to sort of like identify the problems that we have. First, we have Isaac, which is our persona that identifies the or impersonates the um, business application developer. So Isaac usually um, develops in .NET or has, like, um, has a very good understanding of development processes and um, can build projects and um, writes code in C Sharp or in X++. Um, he can sort of like, uh, he's very technical. He wants to build powerful integrations. Often he works for ISVs. Um, he wants to build a third party um, application that needs to integrate, um, needs to include integrations. So he, um, he will build transformations between uh, formats and so on. The second persona we have in mind is Simon, the systems implementer. He um, is more about um, putting the pieces together, um, taking, for example, pieces that Isaac built to, uh, to implement an integration. So he's not so much, about, he's not so much interested in um, using .NET or C Sharp to write code, but um, he would just take, um, for example, transforms that are already built by Isaac to put them into place and um, build this integration, implement the in integration, and get it going. Then the last persona that we're addressing with those two frameworks is Chris, the IT administrator. And he um, is concerned with most of the operational aspects. So he wants to, have, uh, he wants to keep the um, integration, once it's in place, going. He also is involved in the deployment, of course. But once, it's, uh, once the integration is up and running, he needs to monitor the application. And he also needs to, um, he needs to act on um, errors that happen. For example, if you want to import data, um, he probably would see when, when those problems occur. So for those um, three personas, um, I would like to show you how, those, how um, three of the main areas of focus um, that we invested in in Dynamics AX 2012 um, relate to. The first is the standardized integration stack. Second is simplified configuration. We got a lot of feedback on, AX 2000, on Dynamics AX 2009. That configuration was um, very complicated, so um, I think we did a lot of stuff to, to simplify that configuration. And number three is um, enhanced integration features. And uh, we'll talk about it in much more detail. This includes transformations that you can write to import non-XML data um, files and so on. Let's first look at the overall architecture in Dynamics AX 2012 um, for, in, for integrations. <clears throat> and I'll walk you through the, the difference to what we had before in Dynamics AX 2009 as well. So you can see that at the, at the bottom layer, we have AOS which acts as a service host. And the services that we expose are services that run in the WCF runtime. So they're actually running in IL. We have a messaging gateway, which we also had before, which serves for asynchronous integrations. So uh, the messaging gateway is essentially, for example, has some queues through which uh, the messages flow. And um, we use it for asynchronous integrations. So this is used for MSMQ integrations as well as for file integrations. All the services um, that are running in a WCF runtime can be accessed directly from AOS. There is no IAS needed through NetTCP. That's a protocol um, that you can configure through um, standard WCF configuration. And you can automatically and immediately access those services on AOS through NetTCP. If you want to publish your services through HTTP, you can still bring in IAS. And um, in IAS, um, on IAS, you can publish those services as well, the same services with the same metadata but um, through a different product, access to the services through a different protocol, which is HTTP in this case. And um, um, important to note here is also that um, while in previous versions we relied on Business Connector um, to be deployed on IIS to talk back to AOS, we now just use standard WCF routing and um, just use the same backend mechanism that you would use if you directly use um, NetTCP to talk to AOS in the backend. So um, another thing that um, I would like to point out, um, you, um, actually, you, um, you don't see um, BizTalk in, um, in the adapter space here. 
but um, BizTalk is in, in the top layer um, if you look at the service clients. What this means is that we removed support for the BizTalk adapter in AX2012, but this does not mean by any means that we do not rely on BizTalk um, server anymore. All that um, we did is basically BizTalk server would now use standard WCF, config, um, standard WCF um, transports to talk to AOS, for example, NetTCP or also through MSMQ. Um, BizTalk just, in other words, BizTalk, has, BizTalk server has just become another service client for AOS, so it doesn't look any different anymore. The, the big advantage of that is that we don't have any dependencies anymore on BizTalk versions, which was um, a problem for many people before. And um, also there is no knowledge required, um, no BizTalk related knowledge required when you configure or build your um, Dynamics AX implementation. You just publish your services, it's regardless who the client is, you just determine the protocol that you want to use to publish those services, and then you can consume it on the other side from BizTalk or from any other client for that matter. For example, from a Microsoft Office business applications, which I think there was another talk um, yesterday about um, that also uses services in the back end essentially to pull data out of AX and push data back into AX. So this is sort of um, the new um, architecture that we have. Um, I think you can see that we were uh, moving very much to um, standards. Um, we're taking out all the custom implementations and pieces that we had to streamline um, the integrations and also um, the configuration and the implementation of Dynamics AX and the related integrations. Before we um, go to the next topics, um, I would like to just recap really quick on services. We had some changes there as well. So first of Dynamics AX um, 2012 knows three types of services. The first type of services are the system services that we have. System services are newly introduced in Dynamics AX 2012, and um, they include um, a query service and a metadata service. There's also others um, that um, I'm not gonna mention in this presentation, but um, for example, the query service allows you to execute a query on, um, on AOS, and then you would get the results back in form of a .NET data set, essentially. So um, you don't have to expose a document service, for example, if you just want to execute a query. There's different ways how you can execute queries. You can um, provide an ad hoc query that you pass into the query service, or you can execute an existing service, uh, query on the AOS, and you just get the results back in form of a .NET data set. The second service I wanted to mention is the metadata service. That is very useful if you want to build an interactive application. The metadata service allows you to read a lot of metadata, not all of it, but a large part of it, out of um, Dynamics AX, metadata that's stored in AOT. So you can, for example, um, um, query the, um, sort of like the, the system configuration. If you want to know um, what is enabled in Dynamics AX in the specific um, deployment, then you can just use the metadata service to find all the metadata on forms and so on. There's like um, many um, different, um, types of metadata that you can retrieve there. The second class of services that Dynamics AX 2012 knows are the custom services. So we've had those before, but we made some um, significant improvements um, on, on um, custom services. Um, what you had to do in Dynamics AX 2009 in order to implement custom services, especially, especially when they used custom parameters, data contracts, is you had to implement the serialization yourself. In Dynamics AX 2012, we provide attributes very similar to what you have in .NET, and you can take X++ classes, you can annotate them with attributes, and you can turn them into data contracts, and you can write another class, which is a service class, and annotate those as well with um, attributes, and then expose the service as it is, um, also through the application integration framework. Um, I'll, I will show that in an example, like um, what the attributes look like um, when, we, when we get to the demos. And the third um, class of services, um, most of you are probably most familiar with because this has been around for the longest, is the class of document services. Those are services that you can generate from queries. So let's say you have a query in Dynamics AX. If that query satisfies certain constraints, you can use a, a wizard to, um, you can apply a wizard to that query, and the wizard would generate all the artifacts that are necessary for you to expose that query for read and write access um, to external applications. Again, like you can publish that through the application integration framework. But the wizard generates all the artifacts that are necessary for that. Um, one thing I would like to say um, also to system services, while custom services and document services, um, you have a lot of freedom in configuring them and deploying them uh, through different transport mechanisms. The system services are um, meant more for internal um, integration purposes. So they're always exposed to, um, only on AOS and using the NetTCP binding. 
if you want to um, publish information or like um, if you want to grant access to some of that functionality in a certain implementation or deployment, then you would have to um, build a custom service that sort of like interfaces and bridges um, the gap between the system services on AOS and the outside. But in general, we, we're not intending um, those, for those services to be published um, to like external applications that are um, not using NetTCP directly. So um, I mentioned that um, we simplified um, the configuration in Dynamics AX. And um, one, um, one new concept that we introduced in Dynamics AX 2012 is the concept of integration ports. And this is one of the key drivers for, or one of the key enablers for us, um, reducing the complexity of the configuration of our integration framework. You can think of integration ports similar to what we had before in, in form of endpoints. So um, integration ports um, expose one or more services through a single URL. And um, so you would have one Whistle, for example, if you exposed um, an integration port through um, HTTP as a web service, you would get one Whistle for all the services that are, in the, um, uh, that are included in that integration port. And Whistle stands for um, Web Service um, Description Language. Um, that's essentially the metadata that um, many tools need to build proxies for a service. So there's one of, one of those uh, metadata descriptions that you can use to build integrations for all the services that are in an integration port. Um, and as I mentioned before, like each integration port has a single address that you can use for that. And there's different differentiations. We have different types of um, integration ports. We have inbound, inbound ports and outbound ports. I'm not gonna talk much about outbound ports in this presentation, but um, this is again very similar to what we had before with endpoints. Um, outbound ports are usually uh, are used for when you want to send unsolicited data out of Dynamics AX. For example, when you want to send a payment out of Dynamics AX asynchronously. That's when you, when you would use an outbound port. In most scenarios, you would probably use inbound ports. This is, for example, if you want to publish functionality that exists in Dynamics AX and make it available to external um, applications. So whenever you have a request coming into Dynamics AX, this would come through an inbound port. When the request is originated, it's not a response, but is originated from Dynamics AX, you would use an outbound port. The second differentiation that uh, we make is basic um, integration ports versus enhanced integration ports. And um, the basic integration ports are mainly meant for development purposes. Um, we'll, see, we'll see later also in an example that this is a very, um, very powerful tool for trying out services really quick. The configuration options are severely limited on the um, basic integration ports. So um, basically what that does for you is it allows you to publish services really quickly um, with a default configuration so you can try something out. The enhanced ports are the ports that you would usually use in production systems. Um, they give you the full configuration, uh, the set of configuration parameters um, where you can shape your data contracts, where you can um, configure additional security, like all the things that we had before. And finally, we have synchronous versus asynchronous transport supported by um, enhanced ports. As I said, basic ports are always using NetTCP. Enhanced ports, you get all the configuration options very much to what we had before. And it's very also very important to, uh, to notice that the integration ports, although the configuration is much easier than um, in X2009, still provide you all the functionality that we had before. It's, sh it's just structured in a different way, and we'll also see that in a demo later on. So on the enhanced um, integration ports, I already talked about some of those things. Um, first, they're hostable in both AOS and IAS if you want to um, access those services through HTTP. Um, you can also use asynchronous um, adapters like File and MSMQ. Um, we support pre-processing and post-processing um, hooks. Um, you're probably familiar, or many of you are probably familiar with pipelines, which allow you to manipulate uh, messages as they go through. And um, this is like within Dynamics AX, um, operating on AAF messages. What we newly introduced, and I have a demo for that as well, are transforms. So transforms um, are essentially .NET um, libraries, DLLs, or XSLTs that you can plug into the message path that can perform any operations um, that you um, want to implement in, um, in those uh, transforms. And we'll see later, um, this is a very powerful um, mechanism. However, you will have to implement, for example, a .NET a transform yourself by implementing an interface. All the um, logic that um, is executed inside of that transform would have to come from you. So let's look at um, what integration ports look like um, conceptually um, at runtime. So if you look at this picture, um, you have um, two services, a custom service and a document service. Both can be exposed through enhanced integration ports. 
and through basic integration ports. And um, we have um, AOS. And let's assume that both services are first published through a, um, through a basic integration port. So if you have a custom application that wants to send a request um, to the services, it would just go straight to the service and the response would come straight back. There's very little you can do in terms of configuration, which is what I mentioned before. There is no um, transforms, as you can see. This is it's too fast. <laughs> There is no, um, you cannot configure transformations or pipelines as you can in the enhanced ports. But you get this, uh, this functionality basically um, provided um, if you use um, enhanced integration ports. So this is why you would use those typically in production because you get many more um, configuration options which you might need. So let's assume you have an enhanced integration port. What you would do is um, you can expose the same two services through an enhanced integration port. And now you can configure transforms and custom pipelines. So now you can, for example, send a CSV file through a, transport, a transform, and then the transform would translate that into an XML file. We could not do that before in AX2009. Then we can have custom carved contracts. Um, this is what we essentially call the data policies that we had before. It's very similar. You can enable and disable certain fields in your data contracts. For example, in a sales order, if you don't want to publish everything that's in the sales order, you can disable certain fields. And then the um, XML document gets forwarded to the document service in this case. On the way back, you can um, configure the same components. You can have custom pipeline components, and you can have transforms as well. But for example, transform your response back into CSV. This is all optional. You can configure each path independently from each other. You can have transformations that are completely independent from each other. So you could have a CSV file that comes in, and an XML file that goes out, or any other format that you want. Um, the, there was just a question um, I can, uh, um, the, the question was basically what's the difference between um, pipe, uh, pipelines and transforms? The transforms operate on XML messages. They cannot take CSVs. This was a concept that we had in AX2009, and this is implemented in X++ inside of, the, inside of the product, essentially, inside of Dynamics AX. We'll later see, I have an example for transform, actually, which is um, typically written in, outside of Dynamics AX. For example, in Visual Studio, um, it's a C-sharp project, for example. Um, the demo that I will um, give later is a C-sharp project. And then we build a DLL, and you can plug that in um, into the message path. But we'll see that later in more detail. Um, one, one important thing to note here is um, the transforms are not meant um, to replace BizTalk Server. As I said before, we still um, consider BizTalk Server as one of the um, main um, pieces of middleware that you would use if you have complex integrations, if you want to build orchestrations, and so on. This is for very simple. Um, very simple transformations in general because you have to write the code in C sharp. And if you have like very complex uh, mappings and things like that to maintain, then BizTalk might be a better choice um, also when you get into orchestrations and so on. So this is not meant to replace that, but it's like in many scenarios we had like very simple files that came in. Many um, people talked to us that they had very simple files that came in that would like to just do a very simple transformation and they didn't want to uh, deploy BizTalk for those purposes and this is what this is intended for. So let's look at um, what this allows us to do in terms of configuration. Those are the top-level concepts that we had in Dynamics AX 2009. When you opened the, the configuration for AIF, um, it was like um, a lot of um, top-level concepts, and many of them were intertwined, so you had, um, you had to know about the order in which you had to configure those um, concepts. And if you look at um, AX 2012, we basically have four concepts remaining, top-level concepts. And we think that this um, really simplifies the configuration. Also, those four uh, top-level concepts would sort of like guide you um, to some extent through the configuration and um, provide much more structure to the configuration process. And again, like we'll walk through, uh, through that in more um, detail when, when I do the demo. We also provided, um, as part of Dynamics AX 2012, um, a set of enhanced integration features. And um, I just mentioned the support for non-XML file formats, which is um, supported uh, through the transforms that we enable now. We um, support bulk import through the file adapter. Um, we introduced a new uh, feature that's called message sets. So you can have multiple messages in a single file, drop that in the file system, and then um, we read those um, um, messages that are all in this one file in and process them. And um, you can actually specify the error handling in that case. So you get the whole file in, and you can specify what you want to do if one of those messages fails, if you want to continue, abort, um, or roll back. Um, we, um, important to note is also um, the difference between custom services and document services that I mentioned before is that um, for 
custom services, you have to write all the code yourself. In many cases, you want to do that. In some cases, you might not want to do that. One of the reasons is um, if you um, can express the data that, and the structure of the data that you want to push into Dynamics AX or read from Dynamics AX, um, you can express that through a query. Then you can use document services. You can use the wizard that generates the service for you. The big advantage of that is that um, this service, um, the service that is generated by the wizard automatically takes care of all the um, data la um, layer improvements that we introduced in Dynamics AX 2012, which includes, for instance, um, data effectivity or subtables um, and, and all the others that we have, like, for example, dimension expansion. If you don't use um, document services, but you, have, uh, you want to access tables that um, implement some of those features, then you would have to implement the, um, that functionality yourself if you build a custom service. We provide also uh, more than 90 services out of the box in Dynamics AX 2012, document services, that is. Um, this is up from, I think, 50 we had before, so there's quite a few new ones that we provide. Um, we enabled um, change tracking for documents. That's another um, advantage of using document services if you want to implement change tracking functionality. I have an example for that as well. What this means is that you can, um, we now in the AXD, in the document services framework, we have functionality that allows you to expose standard operations <coughs> that um, allow you to retrieve um, the documents or the keys for the documents that have changed since a given timestamp. So you can pass in a timestamp, for example, midnight last night, and then you get all the documents that have changed since then for a specific document type. And you can filter them also. There's like additional filter functionality that we have. But again, I have a demo for that as well. And then um, the last one I wanted to mention on this slide was the import and export of AAF configuration data. This is not specific to um, AAF or to, to the services framework. This is just um, general import-export functionality that we sort of piggyback on, and you can just import and export the AF configuration data like other data as well from Dynamics AX. But this was also a pain point in previous releases, and um, we hope that this will also help uh, and mitigate those, uh, those pain points. So um, with this, actually, I would like to um, give you some of uh, some demos. Um, I've prepared four demos. Sorry about that. better. Okay, I can, I can try like this. Maybe not. Okay. Maybe like this. Is this better? It's out of better. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, it's still, yeah. let's just wait a minute.
Come on, laptop here. And what I want to do in, in this demo uh, is because there's a lot of code writing involved, I prepared, um, I prepared some of the code and I just want to um, write the phase. It should uh, save us enough time so we can get through the other. So, um, Project um, that um, includes all these guys. If you want to build a custom service, what you first um, you have to think about the service that you want to build. And this is typically an X++ class that you want to uh, that has a, a service operation or a method that you want to expose as a service operation. Um, I have. Uh, By default, like um, all the um, primitive types, like integers and strings and so on, are supported. There's no additional work needed. But since we, we need to create data contracts for those, those are also X++ classes. We'll look at those in a moment.
um, this is, I can speak more quietly here. <laughs> um, so um, this is the second class that um, we have, we use in, in the um, service operation um, Hello World. And uh, this is the out param. It has two members, a string and a int param, um, parameter in that class. And they're both annotated with the member attribute, as you can see here. This is all you need to do. So if you have a class, a, um, a class in X++ that you want to use as a data contract, what you have to do is um, you have to um, annotate the class definition with uh, the data member attribute. Uh, I'm sorry, the data contract attribute and all the members with a data member attribute. And this is all you have to do. Then you can use those um, X++ classes in service operations. The next thing um, you would want to do if you quickly want to try out that service is you would want to first build a service in AOT. Um, as you remember probably from AX2009, nothing much has changed here. This is just metadata that tells the services framework how to publish this class as a service. Essentially, it points to the class, which is my class in this case, and defines a namespace, which can be um, anything you choose, and this will show up in the web service description language file. If you want to try out the service quickly without much configuration, just um, get it deployed and um, write some code against it, some client code, what you can do is you can build a service group. This is new in Dynamics X 2012. You build a service group and you can drag and drop your service into that service group. The service group has an interesting um, property which is called auto deploy. If you flip that to yes, that means when the service, um, when the service group um, is deployed, it automatically um, turns on the basic integration port through which it is published. So with service groups, you can really fast, really quickly try out your services. And um, you do this by right-clicking on the service group and say deploy service group. If you, again, um, also check or um, turn the auto-deploy or flip that to yes, that means um, as soon as you deploy this, your service group will, de will be deployed and will be turned on, and you can immediately write your clients against that service. Let me show you how to do that or how this works. I just click deploy service group now. <clears throat> and we should see our um, hello world service in service operation in one minute. I did not go into detail um, on um, configuring uh, the service itself, um, which is the node over here that I, I just mentioned briefly. Um, the reason for that is so, um, this has not really changed from Dynamics AX 2009. If you, want to, um, if you want to publish service operations, you would have to add them to um, the operations node here. So this is just um, this is an additional step. So if you have additional service operations, you add them to the node, and only the service operations um, that you want to publish um, would be added here and then published um, through the service interface. But so um, we just published our, or deployed our um, service group, and we got the, um, the log here. I'm just looking for the service group. See, this is the service group that we just deployed among all the other service groups. And we can go to the administration form, about which I'm gonna talk much more in the next examples. And you can see here, this is the inbound, actually I'll just open that from the, from the start screen, so you can see where it is. If you just go to the, system administration area page. There is um, all the AAF configuration is underneath services and application integration framework. And you click on inbound ports, which is where our service would be published to because we would expect service, um, service requests to come in. And you can see my service group is deployed as a basic port and um, it is already enabled, which is the green check mark here. So this means it's fully operational and I can actually invoke that service now. It also tells me that the whistle URL, again, this is the URL where I can get the metadata, for example, if I want to um, start a um, C-sharp project or .NET project um, that generates proxies, I can um, use that um, URL to um, generate those proxies. And I'll just show you in the browser um, what that would look like. It's just an XML file that um, contains all the metadata. So this is, um, just to recapitulate, um, what do you have to do for um, building um, custom services which, um, or, or for even document services is, you take the service, you drag it onto a service group, and you deploy the service group. Once you've done that, um, you have automatically um, made your service available and published for external clients. This is very fast, so you can quickly try out some, some other things, some new things. Um, if you have a problem, you can troubleshoot like this. You can fix the problem, you can redeploy, and you can um, see the results in your client application immediately. You would, of course, have to like, deactivate and de um, delete the service port that you just generated before you redeploy it. <clears throat> but it's very fast. The second point um, I wanted to uh, make with this demo is um, 
that custom services can be built very easily now in AX2012. The reason is we introduced these attributes that you can use to decorate classes, X++ classes, to turn them either into services or into data contracts. And once you've done that, you can publish your custom service, very much like um, a document service, through the same ports, through service groups, or through enhanced ports, as we'll see later on. So this was the first, uh, the first demo that I had. <clears throat> let's move on to the second demo. Um, let's assume we want to import non-XML files, and we have a little um, scenario here. So let's assume there's a company, it's called Fabricam, and um, that's a car company. Um, a, a company that wants to uh, recall cars once in a while when they um, detect a defect with their, with their cars. So um, what they do is usually to all their um, customers, they publish a list, a common separate value file um, that contains the VINs, the vehicle um, identification numbers for all the cars that they want to recall. Now Contoso, on the other hand, a customer of Fabricam, um, cannot um, automatically read CSV files. So they would have to build a transform if they want to get that list into Dynamics AX. And this is what this example um, wants to show you. So we'll walk through um, what it takes to implement a transform, how to um, set up an enhanced integration port, because that's, what needed for, that's what's needed for um, configuring a transform um, for data transformation. And then, um, and then um, how you, how you get, and then I will show you how the, the file basically flows through the system. <clears throat> So let me switch back to um, my laptop here. And um, just gonna walk you through the configuration of that port. So um, before, we, before we get started on this, um, we have a few prerequisites here. So first off, um, I have created a table in Dynamics AX. I actually should show you that first. That contains cars. So those are the cars that are available um, in Contoso's database. And some of those um, Fabricam wants to recall. Just wanna do a quick refresh here. You can see here the status. The goal of this demo is to change that status to recalled by sending a comma separate value file through the system, transforming it, and eventually um, ending up in this database table. <clears throat> I also exposed a, um, an additional service, which is the recall service. And I have an additional table, which is, um, I think, empty at this point. This table is um, sort of like a staging table. Um, it just has one single column. Well, actually, it has a few columns, but um, one that's relevant for this example, which is the VIN. Again, the VIN is the, um, um, the um, vehicle identification number, which is used to um, identify the cars that need to be recalled. So this, um, this table was exposed through a document service. What I did, basically, was I took this table added it as a data source to a um, query, and then ran the AXD wizard over that um, query. I'm not gonna show this here for time reasons, but um, this is essentially just a standard AXD process that I did, and I exposed um, the FM recall document service, and we'll see that on the integration ports um, form when I set up the integration port. So essentially, um, the comma separate value files, um, the comma separate value file would go through the transformation into the recall service and then have a script that just flips the bit in the car table based on the values we have in the recall table. Let's set up first um, the integration port, an enhanced integration port. And to show you how this is done, um, I have also um, created an integration port here. This is what you get when you, essentially when you say new integration port. This is what the form looks like. I have to configure a bunch of um, directories, which is also nothing new from AX2009. So I've pre-populated um, one of those um, forms with um, values that um, are specifically for the service, but I'm gonna walk you through all the um, fields here. So first you need to specify a port name. This is in this case just FM Inc. Recalls. It's just a unique name, you can pick anything you want. You um, usually specify a description because if you get a lot of ports on this side, you want to be able to um, understand the purpose of, of your ports. The um, first um, significant thing is here you select the adapter. So this uh, gives you the choice between HTTP, file, MSMQ, and so on. There's like different choices that you have. And depending on the adapter you pick here, you have to um, also specify an address. The address is just something, I'm sorry, uh, actually, here, um, this, this is the address. In this case, because I picked the file system adapter, this is just a file location. This will be the location where this file adapter picks up the files and then sends them to the service. If you um, have an asynchronous um, 
um, integration port, you would also you can optionally provide a response address. This response address is used for um, sending back any information that the service produces. In the case of, for example, if I want to create something inside of a table, I usually get entity keys back. If I want to get those entity keys back in this example, I can specify a response address, which in this case is, again, a file system adapter. And it has to be an asynchronous one. You can see the different options you have here for asynchronous ports. And then you specify, again, a URI, which is a file location in this case. The next thing you have to do is like, you have to specify the service operation, not just the services, but the service operations that you want to expose through this integration port. Just click on um, this here, and you can see all the service operations that are available in Dynamics AX, in my specific um, deployment here. And you can see that I selected a few service operations over here. I really only need the first one, but I um, ran the document service wizard over that table, and it just generated those four operations, so I just published all of them. But for this example, I only need the create operation because I want to create new entries in the um, FM recall table. So once you've selected the service operations, the next thing you have to do um, is you have a bunch of um, processing options here. You can also, you can customize the documents. Um, you can specify data policies, which is um, similar to what we had in Dynamics AX 2009. Um, if you had a complex table, like for example, a sales order or a complex query, you can specifically select the fields that you want to expose. So if you do not, expo if you do not want to expose all of the fields to, for example, your customer, for example, if you have like an external party send sales orders in or like some other transactional data, and you do not want to, uh, you, don't, you don't want them to enable, or you don't want to enable them to um, specify the sales price, for instance, you can just disable that field. It's also um, interesting to note that um, in Dynamics AX 2012, the whistle actually will reflect the data policies, which was not the case in AX 2009. So if you take out certain fields, they will actually not even show in the whistle. You're not just not allowed to send them in, but the whistle will actually only show you the fields that you're allowed to send in. I don't have any data policies here because my table is fairly simple. There's some, some error handling. So this goes back to the, um, what I mentioned before. Um, you have an option now. If you send message sets in a file into Dynamics AX, then you can specify what happens um, if one of those messages in the message set fails. So you can specify if you want to continue with the next message, if you want to halt, and basically um, end the import right there, or if you want to roll back and um, roll back all the previous ones. You can um, specify parallel processing. I'm not gonna go into detail there. Um, this has not changed from Dynamics AX 2009 as well. You can specify validating, uh, if you want to validate the um, XML documents against the schema. Um, this is usually wanted, but sometimes for performance reasons or like because you have a different implementation, you might not want that, so you can turn it off. And um, you can also specify the, um, um, the um, create behavior if the document already exists in Dynamics AX. This is for document services. Then you can specify what happens if the document exists, if it's just overwritten or if you want an error message back. But this is the um, interesting um, option here for um, this example. So um, you can see that I already um, configured the transforms here. You can do that through the manage transforms form. And you would essentially, if you want to add a new um, transform here, you have to specify a name and then um, you can upload a file. This can be either an XSLT or it can be a DLL. If it's an XSLT, then of course like the rules for XSLTs apply and you just have to have a valid XSLT that you can import here. If it's a DLL, I'll show that in an example what it actually looks like. You have to implement a certain interface that we provide, which essentially takes an input stream and produces an output stream. And anything you want to write inside is completely up to you. But there's no additional support from the framework either. So you completely, um, you can write whatever you want. Um, in this example, I have a CSV to XML transform, and I'll show you the code um, in a minute um, after we set up the port. And um, this is now configured as an, as an inbound transform. If I have an outbound transform, I can do the same thing a little bit further down here. Transform all responses. I haven't configured um, one here, so I can actually do that really quick. There is um, XML to CSV. And we could just um, plug that into the, the message path. And sort of like that's the other thing. So um, you get an XML file out. You always get an XML file from, from AIF. But you can transform that again like into any format that you want. Only you have to write a transform again by implementing our um, interface. It's the same interface. Stream that comes in and a stream that comes out. <clears throat> and then in the end, um, you have some troubleshooting um, options here. Um, usually um, when you do um, implementation or development, then um, it's always um, good to turn on um, all the uh, troubleshooting and, and um, tracing features that you can use, um, but that's also optional. 
And you can also um, check um, include exceptions in fault. If you don't do that, you just get a generic error message back. If you include um, the exceptions, then you would get the entire exception with more details back. So that would also help you in troubleshooting um, once the service is up and running. And finally, you have some, um, some security um, configurations here. So you can restrict um, certain services for a specific company. So um, they would only be accessible for a certain company if you have multiple companies in your deployment. And um, you can also use trusted intermediaries. That's not a new concept. Um, that was also there before. So I'm not going to get into that in, in more detail. But this is essentially what you have to do. And once you're done with your configuration, you just click on Activate. Because you can see right now this port is not active. And it's not deployed. So when I click on Activate, this would actually go and deploy my port with all the service operations that I had in it and with the configuration that we just specified, including the transform. So now the port is actually active. And we should be able to send a comma separate value file into um, Dynamics AX through the transform. Um, I'll go back to, actually, I have a, let me see. I have to go to my um, file location. So I configured um, those two locations as my input and output configuration in, um, on the form, if you remember. And um, I, have, I prepared a um, sample file here. It just has two um, VINs, basically. And I'm going to take this file. It's not an AXT. Actually, I should show you that in, in Notepad, maybe. Yeah. So this is essentially what it looks like. There is no XML. It's just plain text. It's um, essentially um, 2 times 17 characters. And um, that's the file that I'm going to send into the import. I'm just going to copy it up here. So you can see that it's in here. And um, we can go to the outboard. Uh, configured an out uh, response channel in this case, so I would expect something to get back here. And I'm going to run a script that executes. Um, I'm going to show you the script real quick. That is also very similar to what we had in AX2009. Uh, essentially what the script does, it, is, it executes a um, few jobs that would read the file from the file location, process it, and then do the same thing for the response that comes back. Those are um, jobs that are, um, or actually, um, those classes are all provided with Dynamics AX. So you, can, you just have to write the script basically that uses them. You can also set up a um, periodic import, of course. Um, that those are additional options um, using the batching framework that I'm not going to go into um, detail in this presentation. I'm just going to execute this on the script. And then first off, we should see that the status here changed. I'm going to do a refresh. And you can see that two of those were actually are now in recall state. And it would also expect a response message in here, which I forgot if we configured the output transform. I think we configured the outbound transform, so let me just um, pull this into Notepad. Okay. So this is actually the output. You can see because we configured the outbound transform, this is also not an XML format. This is just a random format, and I'll show you that in one second in, in the transform. This is a format that I determined, and I can write anything that I want in here. It's just that I have to write it. There's no support from the framework other than the interface. So now this, um, what this showed so far is like, first off, like how you configure an enhanced integration port, what the configuration options you have there. Second thing is like how to, con uh, and as part of that, how you configure a transform. And the second thing is like how at runtime actually the file goes from a file that's not um, XML format through um, transforms into Dynamics AX and how the response comes back. Again, it's transformed and shows up in a file location. Now let's look at the project um, for building transformations like that. This is um, the very short example that um, I basically deployed in, this, in, um, in the example that I just showed you, in a demo that I just showed you. And um, as you can see, is, um, we have like one interface that you need to implement, which is um, iTransform in this namespace. And um, it, all it does is it takes an, a system I.O. stream, and it produces a system I.O. stream. And you can additionally pass in some configuration, which you can also configure from the configuration screen. So you can have like some additional input um, based on your deployment, so you can um, parameterize your, your transforms. 
So um, what this very simple example does, um, because I only have two VINs in there and I know the format so I can make certain assumptions, um, I just um, take the file that I get from the input stream here and um, I first um, write an XML header, which is expected. This is the um, standard AXD format that you can actually um, see from, uh, get from the documentation. So you have to have a header that has those fields in this format. This is the um, service that I'm calling. Then I write the XML body, which is essentially I take the VIN, each VIN in the file, and just um, do a do transform, which I show you in the, in the, um, in the, in the next uh, method here. And then in the end, I, I write a footer, and I write a text to stream. This is all it does. The transformation of the actual VINs is here, so you just um, basically take the VIN and you just wrap it in an XML tag, and that's all. And this is because this is the schema that the AXD service for FM recall expects. And then this project, again, as I mentioned before, um, you would build as a DLL, and you take the DLL and you can import it um, from the configuration screen and then just plug it into the message path for a specific port. <clears throat> this was um, the second um, example that I had. And um, again, like what I wanted to show here is like first of .NET transforms. You can also use XSLTs, but those are much less interesting in this case because probably most people know how XSLTs work. Um, and how you, how you can build those um, by implementing our interface. And the second thing is like how you can configure enhanced integration ports and all the features on them, including the transform. Now, uh, the third demo, I just wanted to go really briefly over um, how you can use, how you can track changes in Dynamics AX, specifically in documents. So this works only on document services as well. And um, I have, I'm gonna use the same kind of like um, tables that I had before. I'll show you that in one second. Essentially what you have to do is if you want to track changes in a document, is first off you have to enable um, change tracking. You have to enable it in Dynamics AX, and um, that is documented how to do that. You also have to enable it in SQL Server, because what we do essentially is we leverage um, the change tracking in SQL Server. On, in SQL Server, you have to enable change tracking for all the tables that are included as data sources in your document. So you have to actually go there and um, enable that for all those tables. Once you've done that, um, you can generate the document service, and the document service has a new method um, that was introduced in Dynamics AX 2012, which is called get changed keys. So when you run the wizard, you, um, you see all the, um, the operations um, that you can check, like create, read, update, and delete, and also get changed keys. The get changed keys is the one that gives you the uh, changed documents from a given timestamp. And um, in the end, um, you also have to configure a result set. Um, you have to configure a filter for uh, the result set. So you have to say um, which subset of the uh, change documents you actually want. I'll show you that in the demo um, that I'm gonna go over in, in one minute. Those are the basic steps that you have to follow and then um, you can just use the change tracking feature. So let's go back to Dynamics AX. And um, first off to the um, integration ports form. So for this um, demo also I have prepared a integration port it's also an enhanced integration port and um, has very similar options to what we saw before. It's also disabled, it's this port here. And we can just walk through the configuration steps um, that are different from what we saw before. You can look at the rest and um, I'm, I'll be happy to take some questions on this afterwards. I just don't wanna go into too much detail again. So it's also, um, in this case it's net TCP, it's a synchronous port. And um, you can see in the options down here, I actually have configured document filters. If you do not configure a document filter, your change tracking will not work. You have to say specifically which um, subset of documents you want. So let's look at this example. There's one filter in there, and what I wanted to do is I just wanted to return all the changes um, in the cars document that I'll show you in a minute, um, and did not want to exclude anything. So what, what I did essentially is um, I configured a filter um, that returns all the cars um, that were built after 1900, assuming that there's no older cars than that in the database. <clears throat> so you could also, of course, like if you specify it to 2005, you would only get the ones that are in the year than 2005, and you can add additional criteria there, and you can get um, fairly complex expressions here as well to sort of like reduce the data volume that's exchanged. So once you've done that, um, you can just enable or deploy the port that we have here. So it's deployed. And what I want to do now is um, I want to go to the table that we just looked at, the cars table. 
Um, it's in here. This is the table browser for, for this table. And um, it's 8.09, my clock, 10.09 yours. <laughs> and I'm just going to flip um, one of the states here. Um, let's say we flip this one to um, damaged. So this, um, this um, change has, has been persisted now. And um, I have a little um, application that I'm going to show you in a second as well um, that actually exercises the get changed keys um, API, where it can pass in a timestamp. This is sort of um, the front end of it. And I can just specify a time here. Let's say 809. And um, we'll see the code, um, what it actually does. But it essentially wants to refresh. When I click refresh, it goes back and gets the changes in the database. Yeah, that's unexpected. <laughs> it's probably because. I updated the change before. Let me try this again. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up um, this database real quick. And I'm going to recreate it. I can show you that script real quick. So um, what this does essentially is just um, puts the same data that um, I used for the previous demo in again. And um, we can update the table browser here. So it's back to the original state. And then I'm just going to look at the clock real quick. So it's, let's say, 810 and um, 45. And I'm going to flip one of the states here. Again, to damaged. Okay, and then let's try this again. Something not working. Let me let me show you the code um, in the meanwhile. I'm just gonna try this again later. So what the what the code looks like essentially is um, this is a client application in .NET um, outside of Dynamics AX. Um, what it does essentially is um, it um, instantiates a service proxy, which you can see here, and this is the document service that I exposed um, that I mentioned before, which exposes directly the car table. Um, the FM Inc. cars table. And um, you have to do some, uh, you have to, uh, this is like um, paging, basically. Um, if you do a query on, in Dynamics AX, and you need to specify paging parameters. So you have to come up with um, a paging parameter, which I'm creating here. And then um, we call the service, which is, um, I'm passing in a time. Um, but this is the, the service call, actually. So the, the API that I'm calling is get changed keys. And as you can see, is, um, the first, uh, first parameter is null. It's just a call context where you can specify additional parameters like um, company that you want to execute the query in, things like that. Second one is the paging parameter, which I um, prepared here. So you can just like, get chunks of the um, results back, because in theory, you can get fairly um, large amounts of data. And then the last one is the last sync parameter, which is the time um, since when you want to see the change um, in the database. Um, and then um, essentially, you just get um, the data back. And what I'm trying to do here is like display it. So let me just try this um, one more time um, and see why this did not work. Let's take this one and put it in service. And let's say I'm going to turn this off too. I'm going to restart it. And let's see if we say. Yeah, so now it worked. I don't know, there was like <laughs> some weird thing going on. I had the application running for a while, so maybe there was something um, in the cache. But anyway, so the, the idea is that you get the document that has changed since the timestamp that you pass in. You get that back, and then you can um, basically do uh, synchronization between um, systems, data synchronization, because you can specify the, the time since when, you, since when you checked last, and you get the difference, basically, and you can just do the updates, for instance, in your other system. That's one of the use cases um, for, for this feature, um, change tracking. 
So um, this was um, the third demo that I had, and um, the purpose of this demo was essentially just to um, highlight the change tracking feature that we have, which operates on a document level. So again, like important to note is that while you have to configure the change tracking for all the tables in SQL Server, um, you will also get um, the change documents that change in any of the tables um, back that are in your document. So if you have a sales table and you have the sales lines, for example, um, changed, then the sales document, actually the sales order will come back as a change document um, in that time. That's, um, that's um, the key thing here. Um, I also showed you the document filters which, we, um, with which, uh, which you can use to actually reduce the result set. So you can filter out the results that are specifically um, interesting to you so you don't have to get all the documents that have changed, for example, for a certain company or a customer. And um, this was um, sort of like the end of the third demo that I had. Now, um, the last demo that I wanted to show you is external client applications. Um, this is the demo that I briefly um, showed in the beginning um, where we had uh, the mobile device as part of the demo. And um, the overall topology um, sort of like looks like this, and I'm gonna walk you through the requests as they flow through the system, and then I can show you again um, how you can, for example, enter a sales order from a mobile device, um, and that would then conclude um, the presentation. So first off, um, you have like a sales rep um, in this scenario that's somewhere out uh, on a customer side in the field, and um, he, for example, wants to enter a new sales order. So what he needs to do is he needs to provide username and password um, through some login screen, on the mobile device, on a mobile app in this case. And then we use um, Windows Live ID server. There's like different authentication providers that you can use, but um, this is essentially one of them. In Dynamics AX, um, and then the request is forwarded to a custom.net application that in this case terminates the internet. So on this custom.net application, you can do uh, things like, um, you can simplify the data contract, you can expose, you can again like filter the service operations that you want to expose. You can use different protocols that you want, um, you want to expose your service through, for example, um, like a REST style interface, which is very popular in, um, uh, or JavaScript, uh, JSON um, formatting for your, for your payload, which is very popular in the mobile world um, because they can access data from, from JavaScript, things like that. And then essentially, eventually the request is forwarded to Dynamics AX in the back end. This again uses NetTCP and the standard um, procedures that um, I showed you before um, in the other um, examples and demos. The important thing to note here is that um, we have something that's called a claims-based um, user in Dynamics AX. It's a new concept that we introduced in Dynamics AX 2012. It's not specific to services, but we're using it in this demo. And um, what this allows you to do is you can create a user, for example, um, um, based on, on, some, on any token or identification that you can think of of the user. In this case, I'm using the Windows Live ID. I'll show you how that is set up in Dynamics AX as well. Um, the idea here is that the custom .NET application on the web server is a trusted application because that server actually will use the um, proxy account, which has very high privileges to talk to, the, to AOS, and forwards um, the user ID um, from which the original request came. So this is uh, important to keep in mind. Um, this is basically how we can implement those um, different authentication mechanisms um, in Dynamics AX or in this mobile application. And eventually the data comes back from Dynamics AX and we can return it um, to the mobile device and um, display it in, in some form. So let me go back here real quick and I'll just show you how the user is set up here in Dynamics AX. So you would go to the configuration screen, so the admin screens, and not to this one, but you would go to the system administration, and you go to users, and I have set up um, myself in this case as one of those users, and as you can see, this is the account type is claims user here. The alias is whatever alias you want to use. Um, in this case, it's my live ID email address. And then, um, the network domain live.com in this example, and then you have to have a user ID, of course, and a username, and you specify the default company, and you enable the user. So the important thing is that you choose a different user type over here, whereas usually you use um, Active Directory user, you use claims user in this example to be able to pass in different, um, um, different usernames that are not, uh, not in AD, that are not AD users. So if I go back to my mobile application then, um, if I just go back to the start here, I can just launch the application again. And let's say I want to um, create a sales order in here. <clears throat> I click on create new sales order. I look for the customer. Um, again, it's Contoso Retail in Seattle. And let's assume um, 
that this customer wants to buy, for example, an LCD um, TV. So I'm going to create a sales order for that. That um, fits my demo data, so it um, works conveniently that way. Just looking up the customer, which is what we did before. And then once we get the customer, I can select the customer. Um, this is the customer ID, which also comes from Dynamics AX. Uh, this up here also comes from Dynamics AX. So all the data is retrieved from Dynamics AX using the um, authentication. I did not show you the login screen. I actually logged in before the demo. Um, but essentially, if we just bring up in this, in this demo, we just bring up the um, Life ID um, login page. And you just provide your Life ID um, email address and your password. And then you're logged in. Um, and then you um, just have access to the application. And your um, credentials basically are used um, in Dynamics AX. Um, as I showed you on, on the uh, topology diagram. So now if you look here, there's like different options that we can do. So um, we can add a sales line here. And again, like um, let's assume that this customer wants to purchase a LCD television. And I happen to know the item name. <laughs> and we looked that up as well. Again, this is a request that goes back to Dynamics AX. In this case, we use the item service um, to retrieve the product information. And of course, you can pick like um, different um, properties as well. You can display price discounts, like anything that's in Dynamics AX. This is just a very small example, which um, obviously does not um, look as cool as like most of the um, Windows Phone applications. But it just wants to show the point, basically. So you select the, um, the product here. And then here, you would save the sales line. <clears throat> and then you can save the whole sales order here. So we just say Create. So now again, this time, we actually go back and write data back to Dynamics AX. This is the first time. Because so far, we've only been reading stuff. Now we're actually writing um, data back to Dynamics AX, again, using a service interface. This time, we're using the sales order service, which is also document service. And we pass in the sales header and the sales line and uh, create the sales order for the TV. <clears throat> So the sales order number is 101254. We'll look that up in, uh, um, in Dynamics AX in one second. Um, you can then also see, of course, um, you can have the sales lines and everything um, just, again, retrieved from Dynamics AX. Um, and the sales order has been received back and validated. So if you go back to Dynamics AX, we go to accounts receivable and customers, actually, sales orders. So this is the one that we just created. And as you can see, like I created a few more before, but um, 254 was the one we just created. So this was data that actually came from the mobile device and um, was sent to Dynamics AX um, using the mechanisms that I showed you and persisted in Dynamics AX and then the response was received back. And you can imagine that you can, of course, do that with like office applications with like any, anything else that you have in a very similar way. This is just one demo that wants to um, basically prove the point that you can use different authentication I should actually go back here. Um, use different authentication, which in this case is claims-based authentication. Um, Role-based security I did not mention yet, but um, that, of course, applies. Um, you can configure um, permissions and everything using that user. This, again, is not specific to services. It's just a general Dynamics AX security concept. And um, we also use enhanced integration ports, um, which is basically through which um, all the service operations were exposed that I used in here, the item service, um, the customer service, um, and the um, sales order service. So those all can be exposed through a single integration port, which is what I did here. But you can also use different integration ports depending on your um, application scenarios. So this was the fourth um, demo. Um, what I wanted to show you today is like first off the standardized integration stack. Um, so I, I talked um, about how we get um, rid of the BizTalk adapter um, that's installed in Dynamics AX as well on the BizTalk side. How we um, sort of like standardize the whole stack. We removed ref uh, references to bc.net. Um, and um, are basically all based on WCF right now. Um, we simplify the configuration th uh, mainly through the uh, introduction of the concept of integration ports, which subsume all of the configuration artifacts we had before as top-level um, configuration concepts. So we have like four left, um, inbound ports, outbound ports, websites, um, which you can use to deploy your um, web services to, and um, um, value mapping, which is also um, which was just left over from Dynamics AX 2009, which is a little bit different from the rest of the functionality in AIF. So those are the four top-level concepts. 
And um, we also, um, I also um, wanted to show you like a few of the um, enhanced integration features, like for example, the change tracking or the um, transformations that you can write in .NET now. There's many more features, so um, I would encourage you to um, just check out um, our um, documentation that we have online. There's also um, the solution architecture team is um, available in the um, focus rooms. Um, so if you have any specific questions on your integrations, and um, I think we have like um, in a couple of minutes, we also have like a few minutes left for, for questions and I'm, I'm actually available after this as well. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy um, to um, answer those as well. Um, I listed here a few um, tips um, from the session, just general tips um, that you can look at. And uh, maybe we can just open up for um, questions. In the meanwhile, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for, for your interest and um, I hope that um, I could show you some new things. And um, I hope that you find it much easier to integrate with Dynamics X2012 than you did with um, X2009. And um, I'm always happy to hear back from you, like if you have other suggestions or um, input on these or on previous features that we had. Thanks very much. <clears throat>
but I'm not sure if, if those uh, specific setup items actually are, can be exposed um, easily. So if you, can, if you can wrap it somehow in a query and then expose it, then that should work. Any other? Um, we made some um, significant performance improvements, actually, but um, I don't want to give you any numbers because it's our performance team who does that. But um, I would actually talk to the solution architecture team. They ran some benchmarks for AX 2012, and um, they should have those available. So the, um, I think the improvement was like 40% um, or something like that for some services that I tested. Over the old AIF, yeah. Uh, it's still not I think it's still, it's still not the same as Business Connector because Business Connector doesn't use um, a lot of the, so there's actually, there's also different things, right? So services in general, um, there's like three different kinds of services, right? So if you use document services, they come with a lot of overhead because um, they allow you to quickly um, build services, but then you also, it has downsides also, right? Um, if you build a custom services, you have much, much less overhead. Of course, you still have XML, which you don't have in Business Connector, but um, I think the, the performance should be better for those. And again, like for specific numbers, I would definitely talk to the solution architecture team because we did make some improvements, and um, it would be good to, to know. So the 40% were actually for documents, for I think the sales order service, if I remember that correctly. Okay. Right. Um, so f we're, we're definitely uh, trying to get away from Business Connector for like various reasons. And um, so it's, it's still there, right? But um, we're trying to get away from there. And if we still don't meet the performance criteria, then um, we should actually talk about that because we want to enable those scenarios without Business Connector, essentially. So um, if, if you have scenarios that you cannot um, easily meet um, because of performance, then um, it would be good to um, either talk to us, actually, or to the performance team. Just about specific numbers, I would uh, refer to them because they did the benchmark, and um, I don't remember the numbers from the top of my head. OK. They're in the uh, focus rooms, I think. So they asked me to <laughs> advertise. Yeah, I have cards. OK, um, any more questions? OK. Yeah, if you can shoot me an email, actually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much again.